things first, though, in terms of today's class. Uh, here's your Canvas site, and now you've got your syllabus that we went over last time, and I also attached a uh, basically a tentative schedule and stuff. And the more I look at that tentative schedule, I decided to change it. So I'm in the process of changing it because this is what I do in the first week classes because right now everything is open. Nothing's going to close. The pre-section quizzes are open. Um, the, the web work, you've got to get into the system and go ahead and log yourself in because when you register into uh, your Canvas site and click on the web work link, that's when it will, it will take a few seconds because it will actually store your information over in the web work and it logs you into web work so these things are connected. As I mentioned before, in terms of after you do a particular homework set, um, the grades will not pass back into uh, Canvas. I'm going to have to manually put everybody's grades in there, and I'm going to do that at the end of every, time, every chapter because I just want to do this once, so after things close and stuff like that. So if you want to pay attention to your grade, pay attention to it in web work because I will be passing that back and uploading it into the Canvas system after things have closed, after Chapter 5, after Chapter 6, after Chapter 7, and after Chapter 8. So, But I am going to be changing that uh, tentative schedule, because like I said, I, I just used the departmental one, and then I looked at it and went, that's not going to really work for our class, especially with this new Monday, Wednesday, Friday thing. And so I'm always going to try to give a test on a Monday, Friday is when the homework set's going to be due, and I'm kind of inputting that stuff into the system. So I'm changing some stuff up. So uh, I will be posting that on our Canvas site probably this weekend or so because I'm still polishing it up, but I'm just about done with it. So it's about to go, go up for you guys. But I kind of want to forewarn you. So I'll make a special link. I'll put it back on the syllabus. I'll update my syllabus. But I'll also make a special link with the... Uh, um, course calendar. It'll be a new course calendar that would be more to where we're at and stuff like that in terms of the, the pacing and stuff. So, all right. Well, last time we were working on Riemann sums. We were doing left Riemann sums, right Riemann sums, and midpoint Riemann sums. And remember, the purpose of Riemann is the idea that we're trying to find the area under the curve, the area between the curve back to the x-axis. And we're doing it with rectangles. So, and so these are the problems we did last time. This one was a uh, left Riemann sum. This one was a right Riemann sum. And so, and I mentioned this to you last time, but we'll pick it up from here. This is the actual um, formulas. You know, we're math, so we got to have a formula for this stuff. As I mentioned to you guys before, the first formula you need to know is that delta x, which is b minus a over n. Question. Uh, no, if we have to turn off the front lights, everything goes off. That's the problem. So you may want to turn to the side screens or something. Like that. I know this one's kind of on the dull side, but I don't know how to make it. It's, it's actually in the projector system. So B mi delta X is equal to B minus A divided by N. All right? So there is my delta X, which measures the width. So you start with X0, which is A. You move over a delta X, there's X1. Another delta X, that's X2. Another delta. So we're evenly pacing these partition points out. The left Riemann sum, A is equal to F, which is the height of the rectangle times the delta X width, plus F of X1 times delta X plus, F, plus dot, 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 plus F of X N minus 1 times delta X. And we got this formula. The sum, as I goes from 0 to N minus 1, of F of X I times delta X. That sigma stands for sum. So we're going to be adding these guys up. For the right Riemann sum, instead of using the point on the left, we use the point on the right. So we start with x1, f of x1 times delta x plus f of x2 times delta x plus dot, 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 plus f of x n, which is your b, times delta x. So it's the same formula. It's the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of x i times delta x. But you're using the right points each time. So you're using 1 through n instead of x0 through n minus 1, which we did for the left Riemann sum. And then last but not least is the midpoint, which gives you a better estimate. And so because of the error on below and error above pretty much cancels itself out. That's the nice aspect of it. So it's f of x0 um, plus x1 divided by 2, which is the midpoint between x0 and x1, uh, times delta x plus the midpoint uh, between x1 and x2, times delta x plus dot, 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 plus the midpoint between xn minus 1 and xn, uh, times delta x. So it's the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of x bar, x bar representing the midpoints, times delta x. 
So let's do this particular problem here. We want to, quote, find the left, right, and midpoint Riemann sums of this function. f of x equals 3x squared plus 2 on the interval between 0 and 2 with n equals 4. So we're only doing four partitions because we're going after the pattern here. So here we go. First thing you need to calculate is delta x. Delta x is equal to b minus a divided by n. That's going to be 2 minus 0 divided by 4, which is equal to, once again, 1 half. So my delta x is 1 half. My a is 0. So there is 0 right there. Now we're going to move over a delta x, so I'm going to move over a half, and that'll give me a half. Move over another delta x, which is another a half plus a half is 1. There's my next uh, partition point. And then I'm going to move over another half, which makes it three halves. And then I move over another half, which is two. And two is my end point. And this will subdivide my partition into four equal parts. One, two, three, four. These are my partition points. So to do the left Riemann sum, getting used to the notation, this will be L subscript four for the number of partitions. This is equal to... F of, here's your first partition between 0 and 1 half. The point on the left is 0, F of 0 times delta X. Plus, between your next partition, between a half and 1, it'll be F of 1 half times delta X. Plus, next partition between 1 and 1 and a half, the point on the left is 1 times delta X. And your last partition between 1 and a half and 2, the point on the left is 1 and a half, F of 3 halves times delta X. Now, we're trying to make this stuff a little bit quicker, picking up the pace. So if you'll notice that what you've got here is a delta x in common on all these guys. So this is f of 0 plus f of a half plus f of 1 plus f of 3 halves. All that times your delta x. Now, my function is 3x squared plus 2. So when I plug in 0, I don't need a calculator for that. 0 squared is 0 plus 3 is 3 plus 2 is 2, plus plugging in a half. Okay, A half squared is a fourth times 3 is 3 fourths, which is 0.75 plus 2. That gives me 2.75. Plus plugging in 1, 1 squared is 1 times 3 is 3 plus 2 is 5, plus 1 and a half. I'll use the calculator on that one. So let you know that'll be 3 times... 3 halves squared plus 2, and I get 8.75 times your delta x, which is 1 half, replacing delta x with a half. So now this is the work we expect to see. So not only am I showing you how to do it, I'm showing you the work that you can expect to do when you're actually doing these problems on the test or whatever the case may be. So now I just want to add this stuff up. So this will be 2 plus 2.75 plus 5 plus 8.75, all that times 1 half, and I get 9.25. That is my left Riemann sum. To do a right Riemann sum, delta x hasn't changed as a half. So if you notice, I'm actually not graphing the system here. Not, I'm not graphing 3x squared plus 2. I'm just looking at the points that I'm going to be plugging into it. A was 0. Your delta x was a half, so it's a half. Move over another delta x, which is 1, another delta x, which is 3 halves, and then 2. And once again, here are your four partitions. But we're doing a right Riemann sum. So the symbol for that is R, because we're math people. Don't think too deep in this. And there are four partitions, so we'll put a four, subscript 4 on it. So this will be R4 for this problem. This would be equal to, but now, right Riemann sum. You do the height, which is f of the point on the right, which is 1 half on my first partition between 0 and 1 half, times delta x, plus f of between 1 half and 1, the point on the right is 1, times delta x, plus between 1, 1 and 1 half is 1 and 1 half, times delta x, plus in your last partition between 3 halves and 2, the point on the right is 2, that would be f of 2 times delta x. Again, they all have delta x in common, so I'm going to factor that out to make it nice. So be f of a half plus f of one plus f of three halves plus f of two, all that times delta x. And remember, my function is still 3x squared plus 2. So when I plug in a half, I've already done it before, you'll catch the same numbers on the left and doing the right. So f of a half was 2.75. 
f of 1 was 5, f of 3 halves is 8.75, the one I haven't done yet is 2, 2 squared is 4, times 3 is 12, plus 2 is 14. Your delta x is a half. So I'm going to put this on the calculator, I'm going to add them up, this will be parentheses, 2.75 plus 5 plus 8.75 plus 14, all that times a half, and that gives you 15.25. Now, just a little subtle side note here. In terms of over and under estimates, your left and your right room on some will always give you over and under estimates. How do you know which one is which? Well, when you're calculating both of them, you don't actually have to draw the picture and see which one is under, which one is over. You can look at it by the numbers. The left Riemann sum of 9.25 compared to the right Riemann sum of 15.25, well, the, uh, the 9.25 will be an underestimate because it's the smaller number, and the 15.25 uh, will be an overestimate because it's a bigger number. I'm just looking at the size of the numbers of what I got. Now, left Riemann sums are not always an underestimate. Right Riemann sums are not always an overestimate. It depends on the curvature of your function and stuff. But when you do a left or right Riemann sum, you can guarantee one of them is going to be the underestimate, one of them is going to be an overestimate. Who's going to be a better estimate is the midpoint Riemann sum. So that's the one we're going to do most in this particular class. The midpoint Riemann sum, again, your delta x doesn't change. It's 1 half. Your a is 0. Your b is uh, 2. So putting your partitions up, starting at uh, 0, you go over a half. Go over another half is one, go over another half is three halves, go over another half is two. One, two, three, four partitions, there they are. But now I need to calculate their midpoints. So the midpoints, that, that's the numbers we'll be plugging into my function. Between zero and a half is a quarter. Between a half and one is three quarters. Between one and one and a half is uh, five quarters, catch a pattern here. Between one and a half and two is seven fourths. So, your midpoint Riemann sum for four partition, M, obvious reasons, for subscript four, is going to be F of one-fourth times delta X plus F of three-fourths to the next midpoint times delta X plus F of five-fourths times delta X plus F of seven-fourths times delta X. Again, delta X is in common in all of this, so this would be F of one-fourth plus f of three-fourths, plus f of five-fourths, plus f of seven-fourths, all that times your delta x. Now again, your function hasn't changed. It is 3x squared plus 2. But now, I'm going to use my handy-dandy calculator to plug in these numbers because they're crappy fractions here. So this will be 3 times, my first x is 1 fourth squared, plus 2, and I get 2.1875, 2.1875, plus, now I'm going to plug in 3 fourths into my function, I'm going to use the second entry call down button, and just call down the last thing and change that 1 fourth to a 3 fourths, saves lots of time, and I get 3.6875, plus, plugging in your next partition point, which is uh, 5 fourths, so recall your function down and change that 3 fourths to a 5 fourths. I get a 6.875. 6 6.6875. Okay. And then plus, and then the last one I'm going to plug in is a 7 fourths. So recall it back down. Plugging in 7 fourths, which is 11.1875. 11 11.1875. All that times your delta x, and your delta x is a half. So your midpoint for Riemann sum for four partitions on this particular problem is, again, putting it on my calculator, parentheses, 2.1875 plus 3.6875 plus 6.6875 plus 11.1875, close parentheses, all that times a half, and I end up getting 11.875. And you'll notice it will be somewhere between your left and right Riemann sum, between 9.25 and 
and 15.25. Not directly in the middle. It's going to be based on the curvature here. But uh, I know I got it right. These are things you kind of double check your math, make sure you didn't make careless errors on. But uh, 11.875 is the uh, midpoint Riemann sum, which is a better estimate of how much area is truly under the function 3x squared plus 2 between, between that function and the x-axis between 0 and 2. Okay? But sometimes these Riemann sums don't just give you estimates. They give you the exact area in the curve. Take a look at this dude. Estimate the area in the graph of f of x equals absolute value of 9 minus x between or from x equals 7 to x equals 11 using the midpoint rule again with n equals 4. So the first thing you want to do here is this. Calculate your delta x. Your a is 7. Your b is 11. And we got the uh, at function to be absolute value of 9 minus x. Well, first off, before we get started on this thing, what does this function look like? What does an absolute value graph look like? Yeah, it's going to be a V graph. So this thing's going to look like a V graph when we're going to graph this thing out. But first things first, let's calculate delta X. Delta X by formula we have memorized is B minus A divided by N. That's 11 minus 7 divided by 4. 11 minus 7 is 4 divided by 4, and that's 1. This is nice. My delta X is 1. So now, putting my partitions, but this time I'm actually going to graph this guy just to show you. But all I care about is between 7 and 11. But my delta x is 1, so I'm going to start at my a, which is 7, move over 1, which is 8, move over another 1, which is 9, move over another 1, which is 10, move over another 1, which is 11, and that's all I care about. 1, 2, 3, 4 partitions, as n equals 4. Now, I want to graph this guy. So my function here is the uh, absolute value of 9 minus x. Now, here's a hint for you. What number, when I plug it into the absolute value of 9 minus x, makes this function 0? 9. So, and 9 happens to be within my uh, bounds here. So right at 9, when I plug in 9, 9 minus 9 is 0, absolute value of 0 is 0. I can plug in 7. 9 minus 7 is 2. Absolute value of 2 is still 2, so that will become up here. Uh, 9 minus 8 is 1. Absolute value of 1 is 1. There's 9. Plug in 10. 9 minus 10 is negative 1, but absolute value of that is back to positive 1. And uh, 11. 9 minus 11 is negative 2. Absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. So there it is. And what a surprise. This is your B graph that we were anticipating. But now we're supposed to do a midpoint Riemann sum. So we need to find the midpoints for each one of our partitions. Between 7 and 8, we're engineers in here, so uh, what's the number between 7 and 8? Yeah, you can take 15 halves if you want to, but I'm going to go 7.5 because I'm going to be plugging this stuff into this function, so I might as well go decimals on it. So what's between 8 and 9? 8.5. Between 9 and 10? 9.5. And between 10 and 11? 10.5. Okay? So, my midpoint, Riemann sum, for again, this was n equals 4, 4 partitions for this problem, would be f of 7.5 times delta x plus f of 8.5 times delta x plus f of 9.5 times delta x plus f of 10.5 times delta x. They all have delta x in common, so this would be f of 7.5 plus f of 8.5 plus f of 9.5 plus f of 10.5 all of that times your delta x. Now, plugging in my numbers, I don't think we need a calculator for this one. Remember, my function is the absolute value of 9 minus x. So when x is 7.5, 9 minus 7.5 is 1.5. Absolute value of 1.5 is 1.5. Plus 8.5. 9 minus 8.5 is 0.5. Absolute value of 0.5 is still 0.5. Plus, plugging in 9.5, 9 minus 9.5 is negative 0.5. Absolute value of negative 0.5 is positive 0.5. And then plus 10.5. 9 minus 10.5 is negative 1.5. Absolute value of negative 1.5 is back to positive 1.5. Times your delta x, but delta x is actually 1 in this problem. So my midpoint rule for four partitions is pretty much 1.5 plus 0.5, that's up 2, 
0.5 plus 1.5 is another 2, and 2 plus 2 is 4, all that times 1. So the answer is 4. However, question, is this midpoint rule, Riemann sum, is it, a low, over, is it an underestimate, is it an overestimate, what's the deal? It's the actual answer. And the reason for that is this. When you do the midpoint Riemann sum, you've got to plot that midpoint and you cut it over. So it's half over and half under. Plot the midpoint, half over, half under. Plot the midpoint, half over, half under. And then plot the midpoint and you're half over, half under again. Because the equation is a line. Now, granted, it's a V-shaped absolute grad graph, but if you look at any particular section, it's a line. And with a line, you know, you've got these little triangles and they're basically canceling themselves out because they're the exact same height. So the over and under cancels out, so this is the exact answer. Another way, a very important way, that I can prove this is if you look at this particular function over here at uh, 9, and it's the, uh, like I said, the, the V graph right here. And this was at 2, and here's 7, and here's 11. Another way you could estimate the area under the curve is this. Well, the area under the curve is actually a triangle, right? So you've got two triangles here, so your area is going to be one-half base, which is two. The height is two. For this triangle, plus one-half the base is two. The height is two for this triangle. So this is using geometry here. And 2 times 2 is 4, half of that is 2, plus 2 times 2 is 4, half of that is 2, and 2 plus 2 is 4. It's the exact area under the curve. But it's because this was not really curvy line. Curves are going to cause you guys problems in terms of you're going to have to estimate those, uh, at least for a while. And then you're, but, but straight lines, well, those are nice because of things like geometry can really help us out. The other question, and I asked you guys this question last time is, all right, since for the most part, these left, right, and midpoint Riemann sums are estimates for the area under the curve, the area between the curve back to the x-axis. And being their estimates, I want to have better estimates. How do I get better estimates? What do I need to do? Increase the number of partitions. Make n get bigger, you know. And so I try to draw that aspect for you. So I just focused on two different pictures here. A left Riemann sum, which in the base, because this thing's curving up, happens to be a lower estimate. And the uh, right Riemann sum, based on the curving up, happens to be an overestimate. So you'll notice that how much error you got in each one of these guys. But once you go from four partitions to 10 partitions, you'll notice the amount of error has been uh, decreased, smaller amount, both lower and upper. And then if I go to n equals 50, and you see you got pretty much dots, but there's still some error in that thing. So here's the deal. If you want to get more, a, more, a more precise answer in terms of Riemann sums, the answer is more partitions. How many more partitions? Well, there's the question. Instead of doing, you know, 10, do 50, and instead of do 50, do uh, 500. Uh, instead of 500, do 5,000. Instead of 5,000, do... I don't know, a million instead of a million, do a billion instead of a billion, do 20 million national debt stuff. You know, you keep going to what? Infinity. Because when n goes to infinity, a.k.a. limits, this will give you the exact area under the curve. But if you stop short of infinity, you're going to be an estimate. Now, it may be a real accurate estimate for the most part, but it's still an estimate. You may correct a, you know, one ten thousandth of a spot or one billionth of a spot or whatever the case may be, but it's still going to be an estimate. If you want the exact area in the curve, you have to take the number of partitions to infinity. Now, web work on this section. Now, again, paying attention to physics and pay attention to what we're doing and what's going on here. Because again, this is a very interesting and important concept. Here, the speed of a runner increased steadily during the first three seconds of a race. Her speed at half second intervals is given in the table. 0 0.5, 0.5 to 1, 1 to 1.5, 1 1.5 to 2, 2.5 to 3. And this is where her velocity. So at 0, right at the beginning, so the gun sounds, and she's, you know, she's caught going 0.7 uh, feet per second. 
Then at 0.5 seconds, you're going 3.5 feet per second. After one second, she's going 5.35 uh, feet per second. By the time you're up to three seconds, she's actually increased her speed up to 17.8 feet per second. She's now really galloping. Does that make sense? All right, so, quote, you are supposed to find a lower and upper estimate for the uh, distance she traveled during the three seconds. Well, the first thing you need to know is this. How many partitions do you have? I go from 0 to 0.5, from 0.5 to 1, 1 to 1.5, 1.5 to 2, 2.5 to 2.5, 2.5 to 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 partitions. So we're going to do a lower estimate on this thing. So I'm going to do that one, and I'm going to use a left Riemann sum. Left Riemann sum for my uh, 6 partitions is pretty much this. It is... First up, well, the next question before I get started is, oh, by the way, what is your delta X? Look at your time interval. What is your delta X, or in this case, delta T, because T is what you're plugging into this thing. So what is your delta T in this particular problem? 0.5. You're, you've been measuring in half step increments, half second increments. Does that make sense? So this would be your Riemann sum would be F of, point on the left is 0, F of 0, times Point five times your delta T plus F of 0.5 times your delta T plus F of 1 times your delta T plus F of 2 times your delta T plus F of, um, sorry, I lost one, 1 1.5 there, sorry, 1.5 times delta T plus F of 2 times delta T plus F of 2.5 times delta T, and I stop. So I'm using only the points on the left for each partition. Point on the left is 0, point on the left is 0 0.5, point on the left is 1, one on the left is 1.5, one on the left is 2, point on the left is 2.5, and that was my last partition, 2.5. They all have delta T in common, so this would be F of 0 plus F of 0.5 plus F of 1 plus F of 1.5 plus F of 2 plus F of 2.5 times your delta T. But this time, they didn't give you a function. This web work loves to do this kind of crap to you guys. They don't give you a function, they give you a chart. Well then, the functional values, they don't give me the function, they just give me the numbers. So f of zero is 0.7, plus f of uh, 0.5 is 3.5, plus f of one is 5.3, plus f of two is 8.2, uh, so f of 1.5 is 8.2, plus f of two is 12.2, plus f uh, 2.5 is 13.2. All that times your delta t, but your delta t is 0.5. So this would be parentheses, 0.7 plus 3.5 plus 5.3 plus 8.2. Oops, there's one there. There's a plus in there. 8.2 plus 12.2 plus 13.2. Close parentheses times 0.5, and I end up getting 21.55. 21.55 what? Why? Right. It's feet because each one of these guys is being measured in feet per second, and the 0.5 delta T is measured in seconds, right? So I'm adding up a bunch of feet per second, which is one big feet per second, and then I'm multiplying it times seconds, so the seconds cancel, so I'm left with feet. So it estimates the distance that she ran in the first three seconds. The lower estimate is she ran 21.55 feet. The uh, upper estimate would be a right Riemann sum. Anytime they ask you for lower and upper, you should do left and right Riemann sums. Which one's going to be which, I don't know until I see the numbers, but I can tell these numbers are going up. So the lower is going to be the left Riemann sum and the upper is going to be the right Riemann sum. So R6 would be, again, looking at my numbers here, it would be F of, using the right Riemann sum, the point on the right is 0 0.5 times your delta T plus F of 1 times delta T plus F of 1.5 times your delta T plus F of 2 times your delta T plus F of 2.5 times your delta T Plus, this time, two point, point on the right between 2.5 and 3 is F of 3 times your delta T. They all have delta T in common, so you can factor it out. So this would be bracket F of 0.5 plus F of 1 plus F of 1.5 plus F of 2 
plus f of 2.5 plus f of 3, all that times your delta t. Now, plugging in your numbers off of your chart, f of 0.5 starts at 3.5 plus f of 1 is 5.3 plus f of 1.5 is uh, 8.2 plus f of 2 is 12.2 plus f of 2.5 is 13.2, plus f of 3 is 17.8, times your delta t, but your delta t is 0.5. So adding up all this stuff, and I can actually use the same thing as the same numbers again, except I'm not starting at 0.7 anymore, so I can get rid of that part. And I have to add one more term in there after... 13.2, I'm going to insert the plus 17.8, catching patterns on this stuff, times 0.5, and I get 30.1. And again, that would be in feet. So just based upon the chart that somebody took at these instantaneous moments as they were monitoring the young lady as she's running down the track here, I can tell you, in the first three seconds, she went somewhere between uh, 21.55 feet and uh, 30.1 feet. So you can, you know, you begin to estimate and analyze the data. Does that make sense? Question, yeah. Is the midpoint read more term exactly the average of the lower and the upper estimates? No. No. It's not. That's just... That's called the average of the lower and upper estimates. But the midpoint Riemann sum, you actually have to do the midpoint because it's based upon the curvature and what those values are. It is not, it, it usually is not, mostly it's not that. I can give you some weird examples that it would be, but for most problems, you actually have to do a midpoint Riemann sum, which will give you a completely different calculation. And it will be a better estimate. All right, moving on. Section 5.2. Now, you guys went through uh, Calculus 1. Most of you guys went with me, but some of you guys uh, went with some other professor, but it was pretty much all the same format, and that was this. You were supposed to, before you come to class, just to make sure, come over here to Modules. And now we're up to Section 5.2, so this thing working here. Modules. 5.2, there it is. You were supposed to watch this awesome pre-section video that some great professor did for you guys and uh, take notes off of it. That's important. I'm not going to do this mess just for my entertainment. I did it for you guys to take notes off of it so you can take the quiz because it's the same question except I changed the number on it. And then you're now going to come to class and take notes off of it so you can give you web work. We also gave you a little web work hints on this one. But so when you're looking at these notes, I don't do the before class examples because I've already done them on those pre-section videos. But you should have taken notes off those things. If you watch the video, please take notes off of it. It registers in your brain a lot better, okay? So I did these problems for you guys on the pre-section video. So I'm gonna pick it up here with the algebra review for this particular section. This is the kind of algebra you're gonna to need to know. First off, limits. And just to remind you guys about this, and now we're talking about the fast way of doing limits is really the deal. And just to remind you, when you've got a number divided by infinity, when the infinity, and I don't care if it's a plus or a minus infinity, is in the denominator, what is the term going to go to when you take a limit? Zero. Okay? So this was a real easy. The limit is in approach to infinity of 5 plus 2 over n is actually 5 plus 2 over infinity. But 2 over infinity is zero, and 5 plus zero is 5. We are going to be doing some limit limits. You shouldn't be surprised based upon that last concept that I just mentioned to you guys about more partitions, the better. But another one is this. Just And again, I'm doing these examples of algebra to remind you of things you've done in Calculus 1 and or before. The limit is n approaches infinity of n squared plus 2n minus 1 over 2n squared plus 6. Now, I'm not trying to prove this problem to you guys. I can, but that's what we did in Calculus 1. What we want you guys to have is the ability to look at the problem and know what the answer is. When I take a limit to infinity of a polynomial over a polynomial, it, the, the deal is it's based upon the degree of the numerator over the degree of the denominator, and it was three cases. When the degree of the numerator is less degree of the denominator, the answer is zero. 
when the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, the answer is either plus or minus infinity, and you actually have to plug it in and cancel some stuff out and see what the signs are to see what's going to be either plus or minus infinity. you got a 50-50 shot on that one. However, when the degree of the top is equal to the degree of the bottom, when you take the limit as n approaches infinity, you can get the ratio of the leading coefficients. What's the ratio of leading coefficients on this one? Well, the power the degree is 2. So these are my degree, my, my uh, leading coefficients. Um, and so these are my degree terms. So the leading coefficient is, this is understood to be a 1. This one's a 2. The answer is 1 half. Now, in Calculus 1, we made you multiply by 1 over the degree of the denominator, distribute, and show me the algebra, but this is Calculus 2. We want you to look at this stuff and tell what it is, the answer is, because we're moving on. And this is great mathematics. So this is, as you get higher and higher level stuff, you should be able to look at stuff and tell what the answers are. And this is one of our tricks. When the degree of the top is the degree of the bottom, the answer, when you take the limit as n approach infinity, the answer is going to be the ratio of leading coefficients. That's the kind of algebra you need. All right. The other one is um, simplifying, uh, the other algebra part here, is simplifying expanding polynomials here. Uh, they want you to uh, simplify this thing, okay? I've got x times x plus 1 uh, times x plus 5 divided by 4 times 12 over x squared. Well, strict multiplication and division, things cancel. doesn't matter the location. So here, the 4 goes into 12 three times. The x divided by x squared, they cancel. The x cancels with one of the x squareds and leave you with an x left over. So the answer is going to be x plus 1 times x plus 5 divided by x. And if I ask you to uh, expand this thing out, well, I would just fold this thing out. This will give you x squared plus 5x plus 1x is 6x plus 5 divided by x. And if I wanted to, another way I could clean that up, that would be x squared over x plus 6x over x plus 5 over x. So another way I could have written this answer is x plus 6 plus 5 over x. Usually we can stop here, but sometimes we want to take it down to this level. Yeah, did I screw something up here? Is that, oh, oh, times the 3. Oh, I forgot my 3. Ah, thank you. All right. Times 3. Times 3, times 3. Okay, and then I can put the 3 through it. That'll be what? 3x plus 18 plus 15 over x. But I'm just trying to show you the different ways of doing the algebra. Does that make sense? Okay, and again, another way I could have left this one would be 3x squared plus 18x plus 15 over x, and then I could have gone straight down to here. But this is the algebra that you need for this particular section, just to review our skills here. All right, so... We're going to be analyzing the sum operator. All right, so I'm taking the sum as i goes from 1 to n of xi. That means when I plug summation, I pl replace i with uh, a 1, okay? And so when I do that, i goes from 1 to be I, uh, x1 plus replace i with 2, x2 plus dot, 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 plus replace... Um, uh, n with the last one xn. So when you see the sum as i goes from 1 to n of xi, that's x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 all the way out to xn. But I stop at xn. That number on the top is where I stop at. Arbitrary whatever it happens to be n. So if I did this one, the sum is a, doesn't matter what the indice is, a goes from 1 to 6 of a. You first plug in 1, then you just sum operation, you plus, then you plug in the next number 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus 5. Where do I stop at? I stop at 6. And 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 is 21. This one. The sum as i goes from 1 to 5 of 3i. Well, then I start at 1. That'll be uh, 3 times 1 plus 3 times 2 plus 3 times 3 plus 3 times 4 plus. And because 5 is on the stop, top, I stop at 3 times 5, and I stop. And when I multiply all this stuff out and then add it, I get 45. <coughs> this one. This one I didn't do for you guys, so we've got to work it together. What is the sum as x goes from 0 to 3 of 2x plus 1? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is plug in 0. That will be 2 times 0 plus 1, plus plug in the next number, which is 1. That would be 2 times 1 plus 1, plus plug in the next number. That will be 2 times 2 plus 1, 
plus plug in the next number, but the next number is three, and three is on the top, so I'm going to stop here. That'll be two times three plus one, and then I stop. Does that make sense? This is how you work the sum operator. Now, clean it up and see what we get. This would be equal to uh, one plus two times one is two plus one is three plus two times two is four plus one is five plus two times three is six plus one is seven. And one plus three plus five plus seven, well, three and seven make 10, plus five is 15, plus one is 16. Does that make sense? What about this one? This one is a formula, but we're trying to show you there's formulas even within this stuff. The sum is I goes from one to N of A. What's your indice? It's I. But there is no I's in this problem. See, in this problem, this, the indice, the index is X, and there's X's in the function. The indice was I, the I was in the function. This one, the indice is I, but there's no I in the function. So here we go. I'm going to plug in I equals 1, and what do I get? I get A, because there's nothing to plug into. Then plus, I'm going to plug in I equals 2, but there's no I to plug into. I still get A. Plus, here's I equals 3. I'm going to plug it in, and I can still get A. Plus, dot, 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 and I'm going to keep going until I equals N, and when I plug in I equals N, I get A. Okay, I've got a question for you. What we get here is A plus A plus A plus A plus A in times. Exactly. So if you clean this up because you're adding the same thing over and over again, that's a quick way of multiplying. This is what you learned in the uh, second grade or third grade or something or other. So A plus A plus A plus A in times is actually n times a. And what you got here is your first formula in terms of formulas for this stuff. In terms of formulas, the sum as i goes from 1 to uh, n of a constant is a constant times n. You just proved that in this statement right here. I just restated it instead of using an a, I used a c constant. Okay? Here are some other properties of summation. If I'm summing i goes from 1 to n of a constant times some a with some i in it, constants get to be pulled out front. That's the same thing as a constant times the sum as i goes from 1 to n of ai. The sum as i goes from 1 to n of ai plus or minus bi. If I've got two terms with i in it and I'm adding or subtracting them, I can distribute the summation. That is the same thing as the sum as i goes from 1 to n of, of ai plus or minus the sum as i goes from 1 to n of bi. Now here comes the big formulas. The next one is called Euler's formula. Euler discovered this when he was in the third grade. Euler's one of our famous German famous mathematicians in the 1700s. So Euler discovered this formula in the third grade. It's the sum as i goes from one to n of i. And we did that one a few seconds ago, but i goes from one to six, it's just one plus two plus three, plus, you know, that type thing here. When sum as i goes from 1 to n of i, is same thing as 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus all the way at dot 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 plus n. And that's equal to n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Now, 1700s, early 1700s, Euler was a child in Germany and he went to school. In the good old days of school, they had the classic one-room schoolhouse. Now, Euler was one of these really bright math kids. So... You know, one, one schoolroom teacher type thing here. So the teacher just told uh, Euler to, uh, after you know, he was trying to work, want to work with the other student, said, hey, Euler, go in the back room. And go, hey, tell you what, go add up 1 to 100 and let me know what you get when you're done. Hoping he'll go to the back room and it'll take him 20 minutes like it takes most people, and then eventually he'll hopefully get an answer and then they can discuss whether the answer was correct or not. Well, Euler went to the back went to the room, back of the room, and about, I don't know, a minute later, came back with the teacher and, and said the answer is this. The teacher hadn't even got it started with the other student yet, and then older butts in and goes, the answer is this. And he was right. And the teacher was impressed and said, how did you do it? And here's the deal. When you sum up i goes from 1 to n of i, that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot, 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 plus n, and you stop it in. Right? What Euler did was he paired them up, and mentally, because he was one of the bright kids, he did 1 plus n, Right? And just before n, let me write this thing out. It would be n minus 1 plus n. So he would go all the way out here to n. And then he would do 2 plus 
n minus 1. You get 1 plus n is n plus 1. 2 plus n minus 1 is how much? What's 2 plus n minus 1? Another n plus 1. And he kept matching these guys up. And doing this, how many pairs would he have? Well, they're n num numbers, but you're pairing them up. So what do you do? You take n and divide it by 2. Because you're taking, because you're pairing them up. You've got n numbers and you're doing half of them because you're pairing them up. And that's how we came up with this formula in the third grade for this particular formula. So if you wanted to add up 1 to 100, that would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus uh, 99 plus 100. That would be 1 plus 100 is 101. And there are 100 of these numbers divided by 2, which makes it 50. 101 times 50 is what, 5,050? Yeah, there's the answer. That's why he came up with it in less than a minute and impressed his math teacher, again, some kid in the third grade. There you go. So Euler must have been one of these kids you don't want to have in your classroom because clearly he was interrupting his teacher all the time. There you go. But that is one Euler formula. There are others. Um, Euler, again, was our famous mathematician. He went off to greatness and stuff, but this is one of his first formulas he came up with. Another formula, this was not Euler, but these are other formulas, is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of i squared. That's 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus dot, dot, dot plus n squared. That's the same thing as n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. And the sum as i goes from 1 to n of i cubed is n squared times n plus 1 squared divided by 4. It's this thing squared. It's pretty impressive, actually. Okay? But these are formulas. And also remember this, that when you take the limit as n approaches uh, infinity of a constant divided by n, you get zero because you divide by infinity. And this thing works for any power, and there's a little typo here, this works for any power that is strictly greater than zero. The denominator has to have a positive power. It could be a half a power or whatever. The infinity in the denominator makes the thing go to zero at any particular power. Now, what we're going to be doing is this particular problem here. And so I'm going to get it started, but I'll have to finish this up next time because this was a long problem. This is a 17th century Riemann sum problem. Please understand that, okay? This is what the great masters did when they wanted to find the exact area in the curve. Now, first things first with this particular problem. We call this big time definition. This is, remember that chapter 4.9 we went over, that integral, antiderivative? Yep, we're coming back and finally hitting that thing back again. Took us to one whole section to do it, but here it is. It's the antiderivative. This is called a definite integral because we have bounds, okay? Something new has been added to our integrals here. So, this idea is this. The integral from A to B of f of x dx is actually the area under f of x, back to the x-axis, to the x-axis, from x equals a to x equals b. And it's the exact area under the curve, okay? That's what this integral with bounds symbolizes. You remember in Calculus 1, when we talked about the, the, the derivative, what was the definition, the geometric definition of derivative? It was the, sing along if you know it, Slope of the, uh, not the second, keep going. So the slope of the tangent line, that's the one. The slope of the tangent line was that definition derivative. The definition of the antiderivative, the integral with bounds, is the area under the curve, between that curve back to the x-axis. There's your geometric definition. Now, the definition of the, of the, of the uh, integral is the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of x i times delta x. That's summation. This is your Riemann sum. This is the formulas. And since we're taking the limit as n approaches infinity, it doesn't matter if you use the left Riemann sum or the right Riemann sum. The fact of the matter is the number of partitions are going to be going to infinity, so you get the exact area under the curve. And we're math people. How do we come up with the symbolism on this thing? Well, this is a sigma. That is a Greek letter. But if you spell out sigma, and whether it be German or English or French or whatever, what does the letter sigma start with? S. Yeah, don't hurt yourselves. S. And so we write an elongated S. There's my function, f of x. We write f of x. And there is your delta x. And again, Greek letter. 
It doesn't matter if it's German or French or English or whatever. What does the letter delta start with? D, a.k.a. we write the dx. Now, this is the integral from a to b of f of x, and that dx, that delta x, really stands for with respect to the x because we will be doing multivariables later on, calculus 3 stuff, but for right now, we only focus on one variable, and that tells me what the variable is. The variable is x. We go directly from this. The great masters came up with this symbolism based upon the letters of the Greek alphabet. Sigma is S, delta is D, and that's how we get our notation, okay? Now, we already know this, that delta X is equal to V minus A divided by N, but here's the new one for you, another formula you have to have memorized, XI. XI is the, your partition points. Your XI is equal to A, your first bound, plus I, the indice, times delta X. So you've got X1, you've got X2, X3. This moves the delta X down the road and tells you which X number to plug in. XI is equal to A plus I times delta X. So we're going to do a 17th century Riemann sum problem. We want to find the exact area in the curve of the integral between 0 and 2 of 3X squared plus 2DX. We want to integrate this guy. This is taking the limit as uh, n approaches infinity of the sum as I goes from 1 to n of 3IXI squared plus 2 times delta X. Now all they did was replace X with XI. So then remember, this is the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum as I goes from 1 to n of f of x i times delta x. They just plug x i into my function times delta x. But what you need to know is this. What is the formula for delta x? What is the formula for it? It is b minus a divided by n. On your integration, a is the lower bound, 0. b is the upper bound, 2. They also gave you an interval notation. a is 0, b is 2. So this would be 2 minus 0 divided by n. I'm not going to tell you what the uh, partition is because we're going to be taking the limit as the number of partitions go to infinity. So n is going to be actually a variable we're going to take a limit of. So when you clean this up, this is 2 over n. Your xi by formula is a plus i times delta x. So xi is a. What was a in this problem? 0 plus i times what was delta x in this problem? 2 over n. So you're going to clean that up and get xi to be equal to 2 times i divided by n. I just cleaned it up. So here we go. To find this exact area, this would be equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum as i goes from 1 to infinity of 3 times. There's xi right there, and I'm going to replace xi with 2 times i divided by n squared plus 2 times your delta x. And what was delta x equal to? Times 2 over n. Okay? This is your problem. But we're running out of time in class today, so I'm going to finish this guy up on Monday, and we're going to do a 17th century, the great way the great masters used to do integrals. Trust me, there's an easier way, but you want to do it this way first because you want to appreciate what the great masters did. I will see you guys on Monday.